Welcome to this episode of the Sports Detective Podcast Show. My name is James Williams, and today we discuss if Angel Reese has taken the lead for WNBA Rookie of the Year. Why are we talking about this? Well, in case you guys didn't know, Angel Reese recently broke a WNBA single season record for most consecutive games recording a double-double. Uh, And because of this feat, the fact that she got this feat just 18 games into her young career, a lot of people have been asking the question like, hey, maybe the Rookie of the Year race, Caitlin Clark doesn't have this thing wrapped up, and Angel Reese might have a real shot of winning this thing, including ESPN's Monica McNutt, who went on Get Up Friday morning and made the case for Angel Reese, not because of what she is doing in the box score, but because the Chicago Sky are currently ahead of the Indiana Fever in the standings. So I'm going to play this clip from Get Up and uh, Monica making her case for Angel Reese. We will watch the video and then we'll come back and I will give you my take on it. I have said this all season, BC. My rookie of the year is going to go based on the standings. Okay. Because I think that that is how you have the opportunity to measure impact. And the sky is right above and them. And the sky right now are in the playoffs. So you'd have to give the nod in my mind to Angel Reese. Look, the double double streak that she's mm-hmm. rocking and rolling, chasing down. 12 double-doubles to start uh, is the record that spanned over two seasons. She's already gotten to 11. I think when you sit back and you look at what's around her, head coach Teresa Weatherspoon in her first year, there's not another number one draft pick on that roster currently. There, there's not another all-star on that roster currently from years past. Indiana, they are building blocks. Yeah. Aaliyah Boston, rookie of the year, number one pick last year. Obviously, Caitlin Clark this year. Uh, Kelsey Mitchell has had big-time seasons over the course of her career. So there's more there in terms of the supporting cast around Caitlin, but both of them have been incredibly impressive. And I think those odds don't really indicate how close this race is. Yeah. Okay, I will get to the statistical differences between Reese and Clark here in a minute. But before I do that, I want to talk about the first point that she made there in that clip. And this was the exact quote that she gave. I've been saying this all year. My rookie of the year is going to be based on the standings. The Sky right now are in the playoffs, so you'd have to give the nod, in my mind, to Angel Reese. So let's talk about that here for a second, because I do think standings can be something that you you can use as a differential when it comes to rookie of the year or MVP or awards like that, right? I think that's something that can be important. We saw this happen uh, like two years ago with the NBA's Rookie of the Year award where we had the top two candidates being Scotty Barnes and Cade Cunningham. Scotty Barnes ended up getting the award mostly because Scotty Barnes was on a 48-win Toronto Raptors team and he was like one of the top two or three players on that team. Meanwhile, Cade Cunningham was on a 23-win Detroit Pistons team. So the fact that Scotty Barnes' team had 25 more wins, that was the reason that he won the Rookie of the Year. So relating this back to Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark, if you want to make that argument, oh, may, are, are the Sky like one of the top two or three teams in all of the WNBA and in the, in the Fever or one of these uh, you know bottom of the barrel, bottom third of the league teams? Well, guys, uh, I will show you the current standings currently as they are uh, shown at the time that uh, Monica McNutt made this point. So I'll go ahead and show you that here on the screen right now. So as you guys can see here right on your screen, you can see that the Chicago Sky are currently the eight seed and they have a record of seven and 11. They have a 0.389 winning percentage and they are nine games behind the New York Liberty. Meanwhile, the Indiana Fever have actually won one more game than the Sky currently as we're recording this Friday. Um, As you guys, the standings are going to be all different probably when you watch this because there there are games being played tonight. But the Fever have a record of 8-13, and 13, a .381 winning percentage, and they are only a half game back from the Chicago Sky. So if you actually look at the difference in the standings between these two teams, they basically have the same record. So if you are in this instance going to use standings as a reason to put your candidate over another candidate when it comes to this Rookie of the Year race, I think that is pretty stupid because these th- like there's really no difference. It's a very silly concept because as we were recording this too, guys, uh, the night I'm recording this, the Sky are going to be playing in a game. The Fever are playing the next day. So by, by her logic in that clip, if the Sky lose that game, that means technically they fall behind the fever in the standings. So does that mean Caitlin Clark doesn't even take a shot, doesn't even dribble a basketball and retakes the lead for rookie of the year in her eyes? 
that's silly. That's stupid. We had this same thing actually happen uh, earlier this year in the uh, NBA's MVP race where we had Nicole Jokic and SGA. They were the one and two vote getters. And Shaquille O'Neal was really vocal about this. And I think Kenny also said it on TNT. They said it's like, hey, you know, Shea Gildas Alexander, he led his team to the one seed in the West. And because he led his team to the one seed of the West, we find that as a very valuable trait. And we think that that is the reason that we are voting for SGA over Nicole Jokic for MVP. And you're kind of like, oh, well, SGA must have, like, you know, cleared the the OKC must have cleared Denver by at least, like, you know, a few games or so. And then you actually look at the NBA standings and OKC and Denver had the same exact record. So your logic was that because OKC won a tiebreaker that they that SGA gets the MVP over Jokic no that's stupid that's silly that's idiotic that's not how you should be voting on an award based off the standings like we said earlier if it's something like drastic difference in standings and difference in wins sure but if it's like a game or two or if it's a tied thing that is absolutely an absurd way to pick who you think should win the award. Uh, to the Shaq thing, it, just to indulge me here for a second, I'm going to take like a 35-second tangent on that. Uh, if you use Shaq's logic for the standing should matter for an MVP vote, he is very mad, and he's been very on the record about this, that he thinks that he should have won the 2005 MVP over Steve Nash. Well, if you look at the standings that year, Steve Nash's team had a better record than Shaquille O'Neal's team. The Suns won three more games than the Heat did. So by his logic, Steve Nash is the rightful owner of that MVP. Uh, I know he definitely wouldn't agree with that logic, but we, that's a good way we just turned it around on him. Anyway, we will di digress from that talk. So anyway, th the standings point, that is absolutely stupid. That is absolutely silly. But I want to take some time here, guys, to talk about the different statistical uh, differences between Reese and Clark, because I think that's something that maybe not a lot of people know or a lot of people aren't talking about. So if you compare Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark and you just kind of look at their broad statistics, um, basically Caitlin is ahead in basically every major statistic except for rebounds. And that's because Angel is averaging like 12 a game, but Caitlin's basically averaging like 16, five and a half rebounds and then like seven assists. Uh, Angel's about like 13 points and then 12 rebounds a game. Um, steals are about the same. Caitlin Clark is actually um, averaging more blocks per game. She's averaging like 0.8 blocks, and Angel's only averaging like like 0.2. But kind of when you do these MVP arguments or these Rookie of the Year arguments, what you have to do is you kind of have to compare and contrast. So a lot of people that are talking about why maybe Caitlin Clark isn't worthy of the award, they're talking about the amount of turnovers that she has. Uh, per game she's averaging like five per game I would say in her defense that is because she is kind of like the center of their offense and they are asking her to handle the ball a lot and then she is like a rookie too I'm sure as her career progresses those numbers might trim down a little trim down a little bit but the way that she plays she's probably always going to be a high turnover type of player so one turnover statistic, though, to compare Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark though is assist to turnover ratio Caitlin Clark has a 1.26 uh, assist to turnover ratio versus Angel Reese that has a 1.06. A lot of other people are saying, well, hey, Angel Reese was only shooting like 39% from the field, so that's that's not obviously not that good. The Angel Reese people will come back to you and say, well, Caitlin Clark is also shooting 39% from the field. Uh, that it, number is a little uh, misleading with Caitlin because the reason that number is so low is because this is the same thing that happens to Steph Curry in the NBA where Steph Curry is never going to be a 50% field goal shooter in the NBA because he shoots 12 three pointers a game. And because he shoots so many three pointers a game at like a 40% clip that lowers his, uh, overall field goal percentage. That's the same thing that happens to Caitlin. Two thirds of her shots are three pointers and she's hitting them at like 33 percent so that's going to lower her overall uh field goal percentage but there are other statistics there are more advanced stats about field goal percentage that we can do to compare these two so you can do um effective field goal percentage efg caitlin is at 50.2 percent and angel is at 39.7 percent you can also look at true shooting percentage caitlin is at 56.7 percent and angel is at 47.3 percent but you, you can talk about these statistics and another statistic that people are saying in favor of Angel is the fact that she has a um, higher PER. She's at like 18 something and Caitlin's at like 15 something. Um, 
PER is kind of an outdated statistic. That was a statistic that I think became more prevalent like in the 2000s, 90s maybe. And I don't know if you guys have ever done like the PER search on like different teams, but bigs, you know, players that play the forward position and the center position, PER really values like um, quantity and it values like rebounds. So I always notice when it comes to like uh, big men, or big, you know, bigs in basketball, the, those players usually have a higher PER because they accumulate a lot more rebounds. It's, a, it's not at, at necessarily a good indicator for, like, efficiency. Like, we have a lot other different statistics for that. So PER, I, I don't necessarily think that's, like, a good stat to compare them. But I do want to talk about the reason I think Caitlin Clark still has a lead, and I think she's probably going to win the award. And that is because if you talk about what their team asks them to do, what each one of their, what this guy asks Angel Reese to do, and what the Fever asks Caitlin Clark to do, what do the Sky ask Reese to do? They ask her to come in, bring in a lot of energy, crash the boards really hard, play good defense, and to, you know, score around the basket. What the Fever asked Caitlin Clark to do is like, hey, can you be our leading scorer? Can you create all of our offense? Can you get other players involved? Can you basically be the engine of our offense? She has a lot more responsibilities to do for her team. And if she plays badly, more than likely her team can't recover from it. Versus like Angel Reese, if she plays badly, her team can more recover from it. So I just think the fact that Caitlin just has so much responsibility and the fact that every single time the Fever are playing somebody, that team is coming in, playing the fever and going like, we have to stop Caitlin Clark. We have to figure out how to pick her up half court. We have to figure out what we're going to do uh, when she is doing a pick and roll. Do we decide to double? Do we decide to drop? Do we have people fight over a screen? There's a lot of different defensive strategies that teams have to do when they are playing the fever because they're game planning against Caitlin Clark than they necessarily have to do in game plan against Angel Reese. And when you factor that stuff in, combined with the statistics stuff we just uh, went over, combined with the fact that they are, you know, in the standings wise are about the same, I think this is still Caitlin Clark's award. And I think she's probably going to win it. The only way that she wouldn't is if Angel just keeps going on this tear and like just gets like 30 straight double doubles. And even then, it still is probably Caitlin's to lose. So there you have it, guys. That That's kind of my argument. I, I think it's Caitlin Clark is still the rookie of the year. Um, I, I will end on this note, though. Uh, the fact that, like, Angel is making it, like, kind of a race is very impressive because I don't know how many people that have been watching the WNBA this year are new to it, but this is a very tough league. It's a very tough league, like, like just because you're drafted in the top 20 does not guarantee you a roster spot. It is a very tough team to make a roster. There is not a lot of player turnover and you know, people when they get their positions, they don't lose them that easily. So the fact that both of these two have been able to come in, become starters and impact players on their teams right away is a very good sign for both of their futures. And you know, they are definitely the number one and two, at least right now, uh, rookies from this class because even if you look at the rookie of the year voting uh caitlin is like minus 600 i think and then angel's like plus 370 and then basically the next best betting odds for rookie of the year is like plus 100,000. like it, it's like a hundred to one it is absolutely uh crazy odds to get anyone else other than them so it's it's basically between the two of them but i think caitlin's still got the edge so uh, there you have it guys that is going to do it for this video here today if you enjoyed this video help me out hit that like button hit that subscribe button we are trying to beat the algorithm and you hitting like you hitting subscribe is the best way to help us try to defeat the algorithm and help small channels like this grow so if you enjoyed this podcast please do those two things maybe leave a comment what you think about the video and the the content of it who, who do you think should be uh, the favorite for rookie of the year. And then also to maybe explore the sports detective podcast channel page, and maybe you'll find some other videos that you like. Thank you very much for watching. I'll uh, talk to you next time.